Hello, uh, welcome. We will wait a couple of minutes and we will be ready to start in one minute. Good evening, everybody. My name is Omar Suet. I am the um, representative of the clinical management of monkeypox at the EMST in Bajo, in headquarters. I am infectious disease, specializes in HIV, and for me, it's a pleasure to be today. And I am really uh, happy to be presenting this uh, webinar that will be um, on strengthening capacities for IPC in clinical management of monkeypox in the Caribbean. We will have uh, an introduction and the presentation on the epidemiological situation, and then Catherine, uh, the representative for IPC, will be presenting infection prevention control for monkeypox. Lionel Gresh from the laboratory pillar will present laboratory status. Mirta Margariños from the IPC, for the, for the EMST uh, immunization pillar will be presenting the status of the vaccine. And then we will have the participation of uh, the one country presentation in, um, sorry for that. Uh, we will have a Dr. Nicole Dawkins from Jamaica. She's medical doctor and she's the responsible for monkeypox in Jamaica and will be presenting the um, situation in the region. Uh, as I say, Nicola Dawkins Wright is medical doctor with a specialization in emergency medicine and public health. She is the director in emergency disaster management and special services and director the, of emergency operations center in the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Jamaica. So thank you, Dr. Nicole, to be here with us. So I will be sharing my, my screen and we'll, we will start with a quite um, short introduction. Can you see, can you confirm that you see the screen, please? Kimena? Uh, yes, 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 Omar. Okay. Yes. So thank you very, very much for being connected today. Um, the basic, as everybody uh, should know at this uh, stage, uh, monkeypox and zoonotic disease that was Mm, very, there were very few cases and very small outbreaks until uh, May 2022. Uh, the first cases on this current outbreak occurred mostly among men having sex with men, but particularly in, in people with a high number of partners and high number of occasional uh, partners. There were three very important difference between the classical presentation that we were seeing in Africa before this outbreak, uh, the population itself uh, affected in Africa usually used to be children and young adults. The, the mechanism of transmission was contact with animals, and so this is uh, considered a zoonotic disease. But in this outbreak, the, the event of transmission occurred mostly during sexual encounters. The incubation period for this outbreak is, looks to be shorter than the classical incubation period. The general symptoms known as prodrome uh, that was a, a clinical characteristic of the classical monkeypox is, uh, can be missed up to 20% of the individuals in the current outbreak. The lesion that used to be usually in the face and, and and then in trunk and palm and soles, in this outbreak may be very mild, small, and, and usually affecting genital and anal region with more frequency. Uh, for this reason, in this outbreak, the, the clinical characteristic of proctitis, pharyngitis, uh, or ocular lesion are uh, more seen. The case fatality rate Fortunately, it seems to be much lower uh, with a frequency of 0 0.03. This is a picture of the classical monkeypox, as you see here, the vesicles. Uh, and these vesicles follow a, a classical stage, starting like a macule, a papule, and then the, 
the umbilical uh, nodules and then vesicle, pustule, and scrap. But in this outbreak, as uh, we said before, the lesion tends to be small, and the, but the, the affectation of genital or anal lesion follow the same pattern, but much faster in some cases. The first description of the uh, UK series uh, shaped like to the, a lot of atypical lesions, like uh, the rectal and the tonsillar abscesses, the edema and penis, uh, the affectation uh, or big affectation in the rectal area. And also uh, 10 or 11% of patients have single genital lesions as the first uh, uh, manifestation of this syndrome. And for this reason, we need to be very aware in particular in centers that care for uh, sexual transmitted diseases or dermatology or emergency room in order to reach this kind of uh, population of presentations. Uh, as this um, dynamic of the transmission started in men having sex with men is not, um, I mean, we can understand why it is a, a large proportion of HIV patients being affected. Most of the first description were in, in Europe with most of the HIV patients were well treated with a high CD4. In Spain, in the cohort presented, um, there was an interesting link between a specific sexual activities and the clinical presentation. Therefore, although it's not classically considered a sexual transmit, uh, transmitted disease, monkeypox, uh, we see in this article that patients that had a proctitis had much more frequency of receptive anal sex a uh, patient that has uh, tonsillitis has much more oral sex exposure. Therefore, we, we need to reinforce this information to the community. So although the condom cannot prevent monkeypox, at least can reduce the risk of this kind of presentation that are clinically relevant. Most of the patient will um, improve uh, without requiring a specific treatment or medication or admission, but six to 10% will require an hospital admission. And this is because mostly in majority of the cases will be because the pain, in particular proctitis, uh, but also the penis edema that um, impedes urination pharyngitis, bacteria of infection, and particularly and in some individuals that, that should be more monitored in order to prevent or to, to see the evolution, in particular immunocompromised patients, pregnant, and children. I will show you some, some pictures uh, of the lesions that, that could result in some of this inter in this admission. You have a, a big a pharyngitis that uh, was very difficult to, to the patient to swallow, or you have proctitis, important proctitis or keratitis. The next slide, if somebody is sensitive, I, I ask pardon, but our lesion that our genital lesion that you can see here, some big edema that really it's not only painful, but also impedes the, the urination. Uh, in some cases, sore infection and contamination that required the uh, chirurgical, chirurgical toilet, and also some cellulitis in phases. I say proctitis is probably the the most painful representation of the monkeypox. Yeah, and so this required uh, and some time, uh, some codeine uh, for the management and need to be also considered. The ocular lesion, the, the most important reason for the ocular lesion is the risk of blindness. Uh, if the affectation of the cornea is present, there are a series of five cases presented in the CDC here in the link. Uh, and it's something that you need to take care of if the patient reports a pain or irritation or disturbances in the vision. 
We don't have much information about people living with HIV. We know that 20 to 50% of the cases are HIV positive, but as we say, most of the, the series report a patient adequately treated. We have information in a previous outbreak in 1997 in, in Nigeria, the HIV individual has, tend to have larger lesion, longer duration of the lesion, higher risk of sobre infection, and more frequency of genital ulcers. But in this outbreak, most of the cases that were reported were untreated. And so probably uh, we need to pay much attention to our patients if the patients are untreated with less than 100 CD4, because at least there was some uh, sporadic cases presented like this one that um, debut with the HIV, uh, with the monkeypox uh, before knowing the HIV diagnostic. For the reason when you implement the campaign for identify monkeypox, uh, we need to open also the access to the LGBT population to increase the access to texting for HIV, uh, because it's the knowing uh, the HIV status is the best strategy for reducing the mortality, because give the opportunity to initiate antiretroviral treatment and to recover the, the, the immunity in those patients that are not aware of the HIV. Regarding treatment, there is not, a, as we say, a specific treatment. We treated the symptoms with, uh, with some, um, with paracetamol, ibuprofen, for the proctitis, we will need to use uh, codeine or la uh, including laxans and mesalazine in the rectal antibiotic if the infection is suspected. And then um, there are some, there are the COVID map as proposed uh, as a treatment in some uh, regulatory agencies based in emergency approval. The information is very limited for that. It's the approval is, was based in animal studies. It's one, there are very limited number of cases that shows that maybe the COVID might reduce the viremia and reduce the, the duration of the symptoms. So it's very important to have more information on that. And WHO recommends if the COVID mat is to be used it should be used in a clinical trial, or if the clinical trial is not feasible, it should be used under memory framework. This means we should uh, require ethical and regulatory oversight. We should inform the patient that the drug is not based in efficacy in, in human trials. Uh, we should, we should uh, look for informed consent and to report the results of the clinical evolution of the patient in order to generate evidence. And so the WHO recommend to use the global uh, clinical platform as um, in, in, to, to send the clinical information of those patients in order to capture what is happening with, with this drug. In the region, the, the epidemiological situation uh, is, uh, I mean, in globally, is more than 75 cases. Uh, we have in our region uh, at the most uh, nearly 2,000 cases um, uh, a week. And in the last week, there was an increase in 3%. You see the differences in the, in the different subregions. Uh, we have a tendency, a trend to, to decrease in the cases in North America, but it's also the region that started earlier. And we are now seeing an increase in Central America, while in the Caribbean and South America uh, is probably stabilizing. But we have countries uh, where, where we see in a significant increase compared with the previous week, another country that has a, a decrease probably Peru and Chile, because the strong effort that they are doing in order to um, identify the cases are presenting a, a reduction in the numerous cases. 
In general, we are uh, saying similar to Europe, most of the cases are men, 95% of these cases are men, but the number of women are, is increasing in the last weeks. We have reported in the region 25 pregnant women, and also we have uh, 415 cases confirmed uh, with less than 18 years old in Mexico, Peru, Chile, Ecuador, and Dominican Republic. In the Caribbean, most of the cases are reported in Dominican Republic. And there are some significant number of cases on, on, in Jamaica. And for this reason, we invited uh, Dr. Nicole to be presented the situation. And there are some small differences between the Caribbean cases and the cases in the, in the region of the America, the Caribbean cases tend to be more hospitalized, but probably more because the need of isolation. Uh, and it's a less number of people that self-report as being uh, men having sex with men. Uh, and this can also be influenced by the stigma and discrimination. And for this reason, it's also important to reassure the patient that the issue of confidentiality and the ethical management. Pajo have published a lot of um, guidance in the clinical management and also laboratory surveillance and, and public health communication. Uh, this um, last uh, publication the, is how to discuss monkeypox without contributing to a stigmatization will be soon translated into English and will be disseminated. And also it's a lot of information about how to deal with um, the information and how to uh, transmit uh, the risk uh, and collaborating also both with NGOs and with uh, some application that um, target specifically men having sex with men. We know that the transmission can be, I mean, the, the monkeypox can be transmitted to pets. At the least, there are two cases of, of dogs infected by uh, the owners. We know that there can be occasionally um, cases by sharp injuries. So Katrina, I'm sure we're coming on that. Uh, we, we know the outbreaks on tattoo. Uh, we know that there are few cases described to be asymptomatic. So we need to have more information on that. And although the, the virus is present in the genital fluid, we, we need to, more information about the, sex, the implications of this and sexual transmission. There are some genetic changes that may be uh, justify the, the more human to human transmission, but we don't know yet. So we need to more information on that. We need more information on treatment efficacy and the risk of resistance or antiviral uh, and, why, and the explanation why in Europe the cases are descending. You know, it is the vaccine efficacy or if the dynamics of the disease. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, having you here. And um, I will invite now uh, to Katrin to, to continue. Thank you very much, Omar. Um, and my presentation is going to be a brief one on infection prevention and control. I am going to stop my video to preserve bandwidth while I present. I'm sorry, I cannot stop sharing. I don't know what happened. Yes, just... and I will I will share my screen. Yes, please. Okay, so as I stated, I'm going to discuss um, briefly infection prevention and control um, in the management of persons with monkeypox. As Omar, as Omar noted, um, as Omar noted, WHO has published multiple um, multiple documents, um, including the interim guidelines that include recommendations for um, infection prevention and control. And the revision of these um, guidelines is um, going to commence soon. Um, based on more current um, research and evidence that's being presented. So the importance of preventing transmission to healthcare workers as well as other patients begins with early identification of possible cases. 
most of the pa most of the cases are being diagnosed in outpatient settings and they're being managed at the home in the home so the use of engineering and administrative controls are important um, along with the use of personal protective um, equipment uh, and in combination these all of these um, help to provide the most effective methods to prevent transmission we know in the current context of this monkeypox outbreak, transmissions mainly occurring through direct or indirect contact with lesions um, and the fluid from the lesions and secondary or person to person transmission can occur through close contact with not only um, infected respiratory secretions, but also the, the, the drainage that comes from the lesions of the infected persons including any drainage that may contaminate the surrounding um, surfaces within the home and the home or healthcare environment um, or materials from those lesions. So as I stated, appropriate case management has to be to establish, has to be established to avoid that healthcare transmission from the very first point of contact. Adequate identification of the person at risk, particularly those persons that are presenting with a, with a rash in triage, should they should be isolated or at least segregated more than one meter from other persons um, in within waiting room situations or managed in single exam rooms. Standard as well as transmission-based precautions with appropriate personal protective equipment should be implemented in combination with those other um, administering administrative and engineering control um, control measures and hand hygiene has got to be um, stressed as, as significant and important. So for cases requiring hospitalization, um, the use of single rooms or, or persons cohorted together, that is confirmed cases with confirmed cases um, should, and they should be maintained in rooms with adequate ventilation, as well as um, an assigned bathroom, if at all possible. These are in admitted cases. Um, so isolation and then additional transmission-based precautions, including the use of contact precautions and droplet precautions, should continue until resolution of the rash and a new layer of healthy skin has formed after the, the, the scabs have fallen off. Therefore, healthcare workers caring for suspected or confirmed cases of monkeypox should implement these precautions. And this will include the use of eye protection, um, either goggles or face shields, masks, gowns, and disposable gloves. At this point in time, the World Health Organization, based on the precautionary principle, is recommending the use of respirators in healthcare facilities. And if respirators are not available, then a well-fitting surgical mask should be employed but while performing aerosol generating procedures, healthcare professionals should use N95 masks or equivalent. In other words, they should be using respirators um, for aerosol generating um, procedures. In, if the clinical condition allows it, if the patient has to be transported, the patient should use the surgical mask covering their mouth and their nose, and the lesion should be also be covered if the patient is able to tolerate that. The environmental control issues include careful management of any soiled linen um, because the linen can become heavily contaminated with drainage from the lesions. So it's important that linens are not, um, that, that when they are being removed from the bed, that they're being carefully lifted and not shaken or agitated. Um, and then they need to be, then they need to be washed in hot water with detergent. So wa the water should be at least 65 degrees centigrade. The washer may be sanitized with a 0.1% bleach solution after laundering the linens, but this is not required. Um, dressings and other items that have um, discharge from those lesions should be managed as contaminated waste, and the waste should be incinerated or autoclaved prior to final disposal. And it's important that the patient rooms are cleaned frequently, particularly those areas which may become heavily contaminated by um, not only respiratory secretions, but primarily from lesions, from the drainage from the lesions. Um, it's, it's important to note that this is an enveloped virus, um, which means that the use of hospital grade disinfectants is adequate um, as both low and intermediate level disinfectants will kill orthopox viruses. But it's important that, that environmental cleaning takes place first to remove any organic material um, prior to disinfecting these surfaces. And the use of disposable or dedicated patient care equipment is recommended 
in the instance that reusable equipment has to be used, um, then it needs to be cleaned and disinfected prior to use on any other patients. The World Health Organization has, has developed infographics outlining precautions necessary if monkeypox is being managed in the home setting. And the patients at home with monkeypox should be able to manage their own self-care so there's limited interaction with other persons. Household members should avoid entering the room and there should be one person that's designated to facilitate the self-care of that person with monkeypox. And this may include them um, conducting practices such as preparing meals, going to the grocery store, picking up medications for the patient. Um, the patient with monkeypox, the person with monkeypox, should it's recommended that they stay in a dedicated, well-ventilated room um, that is with windows that can be opened frequently and separate from, other, from others in the household. Um, frequent hand hygiene is essential, not only for um, the person with monkeypox, but also for other persons in the household. Um, and if anybody has to come within, if anybody has to come in contact with that patient, it's important that the patient wear, um, cover their rash with clothing or a bandage, that they wear a well-fitting medical mask, um, and people should practice hand hygiene before and after contact with the patient or their surrounding environment and before and after removing gloves. Um, the patient with monkeypox should avoid sharing items like eating utensils, linens, towels, any electronic devices such as, um, such as tablets or cell phones, um, and they should also avoid sharing beds. The patient with monkeypox, um, when they have to move out of their designated area, if for some reason they are in a home that does not have a dedicated toilet for them, then it's important that they wear a mask and cover the lesions when they travel to the toilet and the toilet um, should, and the bathroom, the surrounding areas that are contacted should be disinfected after use before the next person goes in to use it. And then we talked about the use of, um, about how to manage the linens. It's the same in the home as it is in the hospital. Um, and it is recommended that the person with monkeypox do their own laundry, if at all possible. So they should um, put their, they should carefully lift their linens and laundry, place them in a plastic bag before carrying them to the washing machine. And they should use soap and hot water um, greater than 60 degrees Celsius. And it's important also that um, that in the house that you that they use wet mopping or or wet dusting, and they should avoid the use of brooms and other dry um, dry sweeping, and they should not use a vacuum cleaner um, for in the room where the person has monkeypox. And lastly, I would just like to speak briefly. Um, there has been occupational transmission of monkeypox in healthcare workers. Um, it's important to, re to remember that following the recommended infection prevention and control practices will prevent occupational transmission. Um, not only the appropriate use of, trans of transmission-based precautions, contact and droplet precautions, but also the appropriate um, doffing, donning and doffing of personal protective equipment and hand hygiene at the appropriate times. Injection safety is critical. The majority of the healthcare worker transmission that has been documented has been associated with inappropriate use of needles and sharps to um, remove the lid of the lesions. And so it's important to note that, that that is not recommended. Dr. Gresh is gonna speak more about specimen collection. Um, and it's important to remember that we should never be recapping used needles by hand. If you have to recap needles, um, the the cap should be placed on a, on a solid surface and you should use the scoop technique to, re, to recap the needle um, and secure it. And in, the, in home care, when, you are, when you're participating in home health care, it's important to remember that the environment of care is extremely important. So any equipment that is carried into the, any equipment that is carried into the home um, should be cleaned and disinfected before removing but because you don't know the, the cleaning and disinfection that's taking place in the home setting, it's important to remember that you should clean and disinfect the surface before you place your equipment on that surface. Um, and if you can't clean and disinfect it, then it's important to place a protective cover on the surface before laying your equipment down. 
Um, and as I stated, all equipment that's carried into the patient environment has to be cleaned and disinfected as you leave the environment. So you should not be carrying any unnecessary equipment into the patient's, into the patient's environment, including laptop cases, um, purses, and items that cannot be cleaned and disinfected. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I will pass it back over to, and I will pass it back over to, um, to Omar. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Katrin, for this uh, presentation. We will continue with the status of laboratory, and Lionel Goresh from the from the Pillar Laboratory will be presenting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Omar. Um, you I just think... put in the presentation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so as uh, Omar just said, we'll give some updates on, on, on lab surveillance, although things have not changed uh, uh, much uh, since the, the onset of this uh, outbreak. So I'll start with sharing some uh, general information about the virus that causes monkeypox. So this is a monkeypox virus. It's a DNA virus, and this is relevant to the uh, laboratory diagnostics. It belongs to a, a genus that is called the orthopox uh, virus that contains uh, also other members, uh, including uh, smallpox, the variola virus. And as it was mentioned, it's a virus that was uh, described many years ago with uh, endemic areas of circulation uh, mainly in uh, Africa, so in, in Western Africa and uh, in um, the Congo Basin. At, at early into the description of this uh, virus, it was recognized that the virus has two different clays, and this was mentioned by Omar already. So the clay one, which uh, uh, circulated uh, traditionally in the Congo Basin, and clay two, which circulated uh, in uh, West, uh, West Africa, um, the current outbreak is caused by viruses from this clade 2, which uh, have been uh, denominated as a clade uh, 2B. Uh, in terms of uh, laboratory detections and detection and diagnostics, uh, PAHO has published uh, early in, in uh, during this outbreak uh, laboratory guidelines. Uh, the first version was released on uh, May 23rd, and there is a new version that was uh, released on uh, September the 2nd. Uh, these documents uh, cover sample collection and management, including the types of samples and biosafety requirements, shipping of these samples, and uh, also molecular uh, uh, laboratory testing of, of the samples that are collected. And the latest, uh, the updated version also uh, contains a few consideration on the expansion of uh, diagnostic networks. Um, the, the, the most important uh, message maybe is that the recommended method for uh, confirmation of monkey is still the same. It is the molecular detection of the viral. Sorry, this, this should be DNA. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry for this. Um, viral DNA by uh, PCR. Uh, sequencing might be useful in some contexts to characterize um, uh, a bit uh, better the samples. And this is uh, basically uh, the algorithms that have been um, recommended in the region. Um, there are basically two broad ways of, of testing it. So one is to start uh, with a, a PCR that is specific for orthopox, orthopox viruses, so that detects all viruses from that uh, genus, as was I uh, was mentioning in the in the present in the original uh, slide, and uh, then if samples are positive, to uh, test them with a monkeypox specific uh, PCR. Uh, the second uh, algorithm, which is the one that has been in implemented in most countries in the region, is to test directly with a monkeypox uh, PCR assay, um, and then uh, if the capacity exists. Um, that the positive samples are further tested with the PCRs that are specific for uh, clade one versus uh, clade two of the of the virus. So to conduct the testing, of course, you need samples, and uh, the types of samples that are currently recommended are uh, lesion samples. So it's either the swabs of uh, swabs of the lesion surface uh, or and or the exudate roofs or, or crusts. So all uh, lesion lesion samples. Um, 
the collection of oropharyngeal swabs uh, is also en encouraged, but data uh, on the accuracy of the specimen is more limited. So um, in, in, in a few words, a positive uh, um, oropharyngeal swab, a positive PCR on that sample would confirm the case, while a negative uh, result won't uh, rule it out. And there are many other samples that could be collected, but those are considered more for research purposes at the, at the moment. As uh, Catherine was mentioning, there have been uh, several injury-related uh, cases of, of monkeypox in uh, healthcare workers uh, through the use of uh, needles and, and sharps. And what we really want to emphasize, is, emphasize in this context is that the preferred sample is the swab of the lesion surface and or uh, the exudate of that, uh, of that lesion. And that in most cases, uh, there is no uh, necessity necessity of uh, using any sharps or any needles. Um, you can just swab the lesion vigorously to collect adequate DNA. These, some, these lesions are full of virus and then uh, thus full of viral DNA. And that's what explains the, the mode of, of, of transmission. So there is more than enough uh, viral DNA in those swabs to uh, have an appropriate sample for um, molecular uh, detection. Uh, so, and as uh, Catherine also mentioned, it's not necessary to puncture or to derive the lesion be before swabbing. Um, just swabbing the, the surface is, uh, again, more than enough to um, collect a, a good uh, quality sample. So uh, once we have a, a, a sample, so these samples could be uh, either um, transported to a lab as a dry swab or in a universal or viral transport medium. Um, ideally, samples should be refrigerated uh, or frozen uh, within one hour after after collection. And uh, if if it is anticipated that the sample will be stored for uh, if several days before it can be tested, uh, freezing is uh, recommended. In terms of shipping, uh, of course, you have to comply with your national uh, or, if applicable, international regulations. Triple packaging is always uh, recommended, regardless of the distance that the sample has to has to travel. And of course, you could have different uh, levels of, of this triple uh, package. So with more simple, basic triple packaging for uh, local uh, transport and more complex for uh, air, air, uh, international transport by air. And um, international transport requires uh, to follow the category A uh, recommendations. Uh, which uh, make it quite uh, complicated to uh, ship those uh, samples. Um, in terms of the PCR itself, so the, the technique, the laboratory technique we, we use to uh, confirm the presence of uh, viral DNA. Um, so it's, uh, uh, of, as, as you might know, these molecular techniques require a pre-processing uh, step of the sample. So sample our samples are extracted using DNA or uh, DNA RNA extraction kits uh, to um, extract, purify the DNA, and then they are amplified uh, using uh, PCR or RT-PCR enzymes. The protocol we've recommended in the region is a protocol that was published uh, over 10 years ago uh, by the US CDC Pox Virus and Rabies Branch, which is also the WHO Collaborating Center for Small Smallpox and Other uh, Pox uh, Viruses. Uh, this essay is actually uh, three essays, one that we call the generic essay that detects all strains of uh, monkeypox virus and then two uh, clay specific essays. And they've, we've uh, been uh, recommending this uh, implementation in, in the region. So in terms of um, the, the work uh, and member states have been doing uh, to tackle this issue of, uh, of uh, monkeypox uh, diagnostics. So the, the uh, ground zero for that was that there was basically no capacity in Latin America and the Caribbean for uh, diagnostics of, of monkeypox as it, it was not a, a, a major uh, a public health uh, issue. Um, as I mentioned already, the guidelines, uh, and then we started um, implementing or organizing uh, uh, training workshops. So there were, um, we had 22 out of our 35 uh, member states that were trained in three sub-regional work workshops, including one that was organized uh, for the Caribbean in Jamaica. Uh, we had 16 additional countries and territories that were trained uh, remotely, a total of 41 countries and territories that have uh, received monkeypox uh, virus uh, PCR supplies. And uh, uh, yes, uh, 
la, la presentación que quedó en el slide de sample collections and management. I don't know why. Oh, okay, that's weird. Okay, let me uh, disconnect. Let let me, me, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing. Sorry for that. And start sharing again. Okay, let's see. Is it moving now? No, you're not sharing yet. No? Um, mine is. Can, I can see it. Um, I can see it moving. I can oh, see it moving on the English side, yes. Yep. Okay. Do okay. yeah. you see the, the, the blue, blue and white laboratory diagnostics? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, so please, if any other person has trouble uh, seeing, maybe they can write it on the chat and you guys let me know if I need to restart. Um, so then the, in terms of, uh, of um, yeah, so, so as a result of this work and of course the, the work of, of um, ministries of health across the region, we have now at least 43 national public health labs with uh, monkeypox virus PCR capacity. And that includes all our uh, certified members, member states and many of uh, the uh, territories uh, in, the, in the Americas. Um, so to uh, close the, this, uh, this talk, uh, the key messages are um, recommended sample is uh, skin lesion, so material from the, the lesion. In, and in most cases, simply swabbing this, uh, the lesion is enough to get a, a good sample for collection. The recommended uh, type of test is the detection of viral DNA uh, by PCR. Um, there are many PCR essays, but the one we're recommending in the region is the US, US CDC monkeypox virus essay that has been well validated. And we're available to uh, provide additional uh, monkeypox virus specific PCR reagents. And by that, I, may, I basically mean primers and probes and positive controls for this uh, US CDC essay. Uh, we're available for, uh, of course, for technical support, troubleshooting of any laboratory results to train additional personnel or additional laboratories is if expansion of the laboratory capacity is warranted in some of uh, our countries and uh, to implement uh, monkeypox virus uh, clay specific essays. And before I close, I leave you with the names of uh, uh, my colleagues from the laboratory response team uh, within the PAHO monkeypox incident management and support team. Over to you, Omar. Muchísimas gracias, Lionel. Eh, bueno, ahora vamos a continuar con la presencia de Mirta Magariños y sorry, we will continue with Mirta Magariños and the status of vaccines. Thank you, Omar. I'm sharing my, my screen. It's okay. It will be put in the presentation. Yes, it's perfect. Thank okay. You. I'm doing my presentation in Spanish, uh, but the PPT is in English. It's okay for you? Yes, we have translation. So those that are uh, that they are required to listen in English, they can go to interpretation and, and follow the presentation in, in okay. with the translation. Thank you. Well, eh, eh, bueno, en mi presentación vamos a hablar un poquito de cómo es la línea de las vacunas contra la viruela símica, las recomendaciones del grupo técnico asesor, la guía para el uso de las vacunas contra la monkeypox, algunas consideraciones especiales para el despliegue de las vacunas y algunos desafíos que tenemos que tener en cuenta en términos de comunicación de estas actividades de vacunación. Específicamente, ustedes saben que hay distintas generaciones de vacunas, pero de la que vamos a hablar es sobre todo de la de tercera generación, que es una vacuna que es no replicativa, que es la vacuna que están aprobadas según la autoridad regulatoria, reciben distintos nombres, pero tienen aprobación tanto para la viruela como para la viruela cínica. 
se administra por vía subcutánea en dos dosis y con un intervalo de cuatro semanas entre las dos series. Y luego de 14 días de completada la segunda dosis, eh, se pueden encontrar los títulos protectores para esta vacuna. En aquellos que previamente recibieron ya sea alguna vacuna como la de primera generación, pueden recibir una dosis única. Y el otro tema que es importante tener en cuenta es que la eficacia de esta vacuna para eh, la prevención de la viruela símica se ha obtenido a partir de ensayos de respuestas de anticuerpos, de ensayos clínicos en, en monos específicamente, que fueron desafiados por eh, el virus de la viruela símica, pero en, la, en realidad no se conoce cuál es aún la eficacia de esta vacuna en el actual brote. Hay algunas recomendaciones generales de la OMS que tienen que ver con que, de acuerdo al análisis de riesgos y beneficios, por este momento no es necesario ni está requerido la vacunación universal o masiva contra la viruela símica, dado que el control de la transmisión de persona a persona puede realizarse a través de medidas de salud pública, incluyendo, por supuesto, las medidas de detección de casos, de cuidado, de diagnóstico, de autocuidado, de aislamiento y de automonitoreo. Y en este sentido, la vacunación es considerada una medida adicional y complementaria para estas medidas de salud pública. El otro aspecto que es importante considerar es que las decisiones de la utilización de estas vacunas deben ser hechas en función de un análisis de riesgo-beneficio en caso a caso. Pero lo otro que no es menor y que es necesario que aquellos que reciban la vacuna tengan presente, que aún estando vacunados, esto no reemplaza todas las otras medidas protectoras. Eh, nuestro grupo técnico asesor de inmunizaciones eh, se reunió primero en mayo y, y posteriormente en julio y la recomendación es que la utilización para aquellos países que dispongan de vacuna sea en los contactos eh, de casos confirmados y esto relacionado en función del riesgo de exposición. Y esta vacunación post exposición especialmente considerada eh, dentro de los cuatro días es lo ideal, pero hasta los 14 días. También mencionan que no hay espacio para la vacunación masiva y también como en ese momento la, la, la presentación incluía las vacunas disponibles, también tenía alguna alerta con respecto a la posibilidad de, de la, los efectos adversos que pudieran generar las vacunas, especialmente las de segunda generación, que son vacunas replicativas. Y también el TAC eh, recomendaba a la OPS desarrollar una guía o unas orientaciones para la utilización de las vacunas. Y en ese sentido se ha desarrollado la guía, que próximamente va a estar publicada también en inglés, y que el propósito es utilizar una forma de una manera accesible y entendible el, los conocimientos acerca de las vacunas, que para facilitar es justamente el despliegue y las estrategias en el contexto del brote actual y en el contexto de las recomendaciones del grupo técnico asesor. Y para ello se tiene en consideración que la, el objetivo global de la respuesta es interrumpir la transmisión humana-humana de acuerdo a la declaración de emergencia. Y el uso de las vacunas pueden contribuir a esa respuesta y son una medida complementaria. Eh, es también un marco que da algunas características y todas las necesarias para poder entender y comprender estas vacunas y su utilización y está organizada en distintos componentes que tienen que ver, que son necesarios para el, el despliegue. Y una de las cosas específicas que uno tiene que considerar eh, en esta vacuna tiene que ver el ajuste del sistema de información que es necesario llevar adelante para poder registrar adecuadamente estas vacunas con la consideración especial de los criterios de elegibilidad y los criterios de oportunidad. Las recomendaciones del TAC hacen hincapié en la administración post-exposición, entonces en ese sentido uno tiene que poder identificar 
si es un contacto de un caso confirmado o, un, o de una ocupación, de una exposición ocupacional, y entonces a uno le va a poder eh, permitir, a través de su sistema de información, ver si el criterio de elegibilidad definido se cumple para la administración de las vacunas. Pero también va a ser necesario, si uno piensa en posexposición, poder tener la fecha de la exposición, porque esto es lo que va a complementar y va a permitir saber si se hace dentro del periodo de cuatro días en términos de oportunidad a, o se extiende hasta los 14 días o posterior a los 14 días. Pero a su vez, esta información va a poder ayudar a generar evidencia en términos de en qué momentos uno realiza la vacunación y cuál es la respuesta hacia, hacia la vacuna. Las otras variables son los, eh, las habituales que utiliza el sistema cuando uno habla de tiempo, de espacio y de las características de la vacuna y son necesarias para asegurar la trazabilidad y la información de seguridad. Pero esta vacunación tiene algunos desafíos adicionales cuando uno la quiere llevar a cabo. Primero, no hay que perder de vista cuál es el objetivo global de la respuesta. Por otro lado, que las vacunas, les vuelvo a decir, son una medida complementaria. A su vez, que hay una limitada disponibilidad de vacunas. Y entonces va a ser un desafío. ¿Cuál va a ser el criterio de priorización de las poblaciones elegidas? Pero no menor también, una vez que una define, uno define cuáles son las poblaciones que va a priorizar, ¿cómo va a ser el acceso de esas poblaciones a la vacunación? Y el otro tema que también hay que considerar es cómo se va a realizar ese análisis caso a caso de riesgo-beneficio, porque uno puede ofrecer la vacuna, pero la persona también tiene el derecho de saber que con otras medidas puede también estar protegido y finalmente tomar su decisión. Los otros desafíos tienen que ver con todo el monitoreo de la seguridad de las vacunas y, por supuesto, la generación de evidencia en tanto en la eficacia como en la seguridad, tal cual mencionó Omar al inicio, también la OMS recomienda hacerlo bajo protocolos de ensayos clínicos esta, eh, o bajo un protocolo nuevo. Y hay dos desafíos muy importantes en términos de comunicación de esta vacunación. Uno tiene que ver cómo se va a comunicar la priorización, cómo se va a hacer cuidando el estigma, la importancia a su vez también de comunicar la importancia de que aún vacunados hay que mantener el autocuidado, cómo uno va a poder hacer esta comunicación en, en, digamos con respecto a los protocolos para mantener la confianza en la vacunación y para que no sea un obstáculo para aquellos que puedan ser destinatarios de la misma, tengan dudas. Pero también para los países van a tener un desafío adicional en la comunicación en función de tres escenarios. Aquellos países que tienen casos y que pertenecen al grupo 2 de la declaración de emergencia, pero a su vez reciben un limitado stock de vacuna. Aquellos países que tienen la misma situación epidemiológica con alto número de casos, pero entre su estrategia de país han decidido no utilizar la vacuna. Y por otro lado, aquellos países que no tienen casos, como son aquellos del grupo 1, y que aún demandan la vacuna y la priorización y la comunicación va a ser un desafío. Eso creo que es todo y te paso nuevamente a vos, Omar. Gracias. Thank you very much, Mirta. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation, we have the pleasure to have the Nicole Downing, Director of the Operations Center, Ministry of Health of Wellness from Jamaica, to share the experience of Jamaica, one of the country with a more strong response in, in the English Caribbean. Uh, go ahead, Nicole, please. You can share it. Usually. Thank you very much, Omar and team. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone on the platform. Let me first of all thank the organizers, Paho and the team, for bringing this webinar together and more importantly for asking us here in Jamaica uh, to make presentation to support our workforce strengthening. So what I'm going to be presenting in a few minutes is um, 
what we have been doing in country in and, and just to unveil a little bit of the information that we have in terms of the local epidemiology and our response and use that as a basis uh, to just highlight some key lessons that I believe may have been learned but have more importantly have served to be affirmed uh, through this response. So uh, as shared earlier in the presentation, um, just up to 2021, the context really is that prior to this period, for the most part, monkeypox would have been something that's not on the forefront of our minds based on the fact that it was located mainly um, in the Western part of, of Africa uh, and only had imported cases in a few countries. And now, when we look at the picture in terms of the numbers available, uh, the situation has really changed in that more than 109 member states are now reporting cases uh, at present. And we are seeing that the vast majority is on this side of the globe in the region of the Americas, in excess of 75,000, 76,000 cases being confirmed and uh, associated with significant number of deaths, those small 36. And within the region of the Americas, we have 50,000 cases, uh, which makes up the larger portion of the all cases in the current outbreak associated with 16 deaths. So to appreciate uh, the importance of, 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 of the presentation and our experience, we have to look in the context of what Jamaica really is. Jamaica is a small island state, uh, classified as an upper middle income developing country. And as such, um, it speaks volumes uh, or, or highlights the challenges we may experience in terms of our response capacity, uh, whether or not we can sustain the response that is required. Uh, it is the third largest country within the Caribbean in spite of its size um, and also uh, significantly in terms of the population we're dealing with a fair number of 2.8 million persons. It is important as well in terms of the coordination to look in terms of our, our jurisdictions and how our governance is stated. And I've highlighted the fact that we do have administratively 14 parishes, but the local government, uh, the local control, our local measures is really within 13 jurisdictions. And for the Ministry of Health and Wellness at national level, we coordinate our response to the four regional health authorities in terms of accountability and how uh, uh, the response is coordinated and implemented in the field. So in this context, the Jamaica takes its guidance very responsive in terms of our um, crisis emergency and disaster response. And we take our cue from what the PAHO WHO would have provided and um, providing the, the guidance in terms of how we plan our response in country. And based on the temporary recommendations that would have been issued in the context of the multi-country um, monkeypox outbreak, Jamaica would have fallen within group two, uh, which are state parties with recently imported cases of monkeypox in the population, um, with um, including key population groups and communities at high risk of exposure. That being said, uh, Jamaica's emergency and disaster management um, program uh, would have, for the most part, in terms of our responses, generally speaking, our response framework tend to um, be fairly similar. And so uh, uh, once we decide, um, once there's a situation to which we need to respond to, we'd have crafted our response, our plan of action, based on this general framework. And for the monkeypox situation, we would have planned our activities and our response along five key pillars of action in terms of coordination, um, given the consideration for the governance structure in in, in the country uh, along the lines of the plan of action for surveillance monitoring and laboratory capacity with a specific uh, focus to, in, to, to seek to acquire and establish local testing capacity in country, uh, what measures we need to do to contain once the, 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 the event or the situation, the infection comes into country and this includes our provisions for our vaccination program. What would the health system need to do in terms of being able to manage any cases that we have? And last, but by no means least, ensure that we have a robust and active risk communication and community, community engagement plan. That being said, this slide is very, very busy, but it's not to shock you in terms of what it is. It's really just to say that from the alert was issued, uh, Jamaica with its level of responsiveness also got very busy. And we, we would have gotten very busy because prior to the current outbreak, Jamaica would never have, be, have, have diagnosed monkeypox in country. And 
That being said, we would have classified that condition as an exotic disease or pre-existing institutional framework is what we would have used to craft and design our response plan. And it makes provisions for such exotic situation in our public health act so that we can start our, our, um, our activities in terms of what we need to do um, with a view to con containing or at least responding to the situation using for the most part our class one notification system. So we would have sat down and decided with the guidance that would have been provided through PAHO WHO in terms of defining our, our case de definitions so that we can um, ensure that we have a standardized response throughout the country. And uh, with the technical team would have sat down and deliberated and come up with appropriate response protocols and procedures guided by well, um, with the guidance that comes out from PAHO WHO to inform what is the protocol within the context that we have. And in the initial phases, we would have outlined and provided in addition to the surveillance protocol, uh, protocols for the laboratory procedures or notification, contact tracing, and clinical management that is informed by a monkeypox care pathway that we disseminate um, to our responders. So, so from very early, we would have had a response from the alert was issued, and we started with risk communication and communi um, community engagement pillar of action through a series of sensitization and activities. And again, we use the existing institutional framework that we have in country and want to disseminate the information fairly rapidly in the context of a situation that is likely to be imported in country would have been the international health regulations and our stakeholder advisory group and technical working group that we have in country um, to manage in terms of our border health sector procedures and, and the uh, uh, me mechanism that we have and the machinery that it has to disseminate information. So through that mechanism, we would have communicated what we know thus far to provide sensitization to the persons who would need to respond, and with the partnership and collaboration of PAHO to um, engage in early webinar to sensitize not just um, the, the population in country and our healthcare workers, but generally speaking, so that all players are aware from early using information available on classical monkeypox at the time would, of course, would have introduced um, the considerations that we have um, for the different protocols and, of course, targeting our first responders and our frontline workers, because, again, it's important for, for all persons who must respond to uh, be guided by providing the guidance so that we have a standardized response across the country. And we would have developed information um, and education communication material that we disseminate uh, as a standard measure throughout. And we provide updates as new information comes through, through the existing um, machinery that we have for dissemination of information, either through the IHR SAG and, and technical working group or through our health education and promo um, promotion programs that we have routinely at national and subnational levels. With the support of PAHO, we would have sought to have gotten, um, uh, as presented earlier, uh, the support of PAHO to establish testing capacity in country. And we managed to do this by June 22 of this year. Um, it did not take us long to realize that we would have had, based on an introduction of potential uh, of possible cases, uh, that we would have had samples to be tested. And so within a month, uh, within two months of having established the capacity, we would have started testing and received some of about 30 samples with 14, 14 monkeypox results uh, being positive. It didn't take long. This is a situation that evolved very rapidly and dynamically and caused us um, a, a lot of uh, work to be done on the ground because our first case was confirmed on July 6, as we had reported and identified. This was in a gentleman who had recently traveled from the United Kingdom. Fortunately, he had presented to our public health system and our, um, on, this, on, on the 5th, having arrived in the country some five days earlier. It's important to highlight this because a lot of our persons um, access, uh, especially uh, pri primary care services in our private sector. And so that is an issue that we also have to grapple with when we comes to how we manage a situation in country. He was isolated at home and his close contacts were quarantined. With this, it, it promulgated further intensifying our actions and we use again the existing machine that we have within our public health act and our governance framework that allows for provisions to deal with a situation such as this and how we have provided for additional measures that is not um, that are the existing regulations and the routine measures does not provide is by the promulgation of an order 
under the Public Health Act uh, by the convening of a central health committee. And we did this fairly quickly after um, having recognized that we have an urgent situation for attention and produced um, uh, the order that had two specific articles to deal with persons who may be diagnosed with monkeypox and also for stipulations for quarantine. And these went into effect on July 14th. Needless to say, we have to also review and take into consideration the, the, the aggressiveness of, of our risk communication and engagement plan and ensure that we have uh, 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 the, the, acquired, the required resources to mobilize as well as to ensure that we have a standard uh, message platform to deliver the message that we need to, to in order to empower both the persons um, who may be affected and the people who must provide care for persons who would be affected. So we had divided initially uh, the communication plan to go up at least until the end of the financial year to ensure uh, that this is something that we pay keen attention to. And at the outset, we would have identified our target population as being the sexually active population for, uh, for uh, given our current context in Jamaica as it relates to um, persons who may who are at highest risk. Um, we're focusing on our sexually active population, all categories of persons in general, and reviewed it based on information that would come to the fore. Of course, like most other things, uh, public health significance, we have to ensure that we have a multi-sectoral response and multi-agency uh, coordination mechanism. So we ensure that key agencies were also formally advised and to provide the requisite support and, 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 and guidance needed for the to controls in the different sectors with a keen attention being paid to our entertainment sector and our education sector, because we, we, we would seek also to ensure that the, the particular vulnerable groups are, are provided for in the provisions that we have. In terms of our containment, uh, whilst we would not necessarily have needed to do any additional measures in terms of infrastructure needs, we certainly would have, of course, enhanced and strengthened our um, infection prevention and control capacities at facility levels. And we, with the guidance that we would have had in terms of what we need to do for quarantine and isolation, um, follow those guidelines. And um, as it relates to case identification, home quarantine as is necessary and isolation and hospitalization being based on clinical need. We would have reviewed um, what measures in, are in place at health facilities, both to protect the workforce and to ensure that there is no localized uh, risk, uh, heightened risk of transmission at health facilities for persons who may present, looking at the, the different controls administratively and engineering that would have been established before amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, but certainly would have had to have been promulgated and sustained as part of the response requirements for the monkeypox outbreak in country. We also would have had um, our discussions with our, um, our, 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 our vaccination team leads to establish advisory group and have meetings and discussions as to what this may be, what Jamaica may require in the context of, of, of vaccination. And with the support and guidance from PAHO again, uh, we would have decided exactly and part, using the prioritization procedure and determined um, a volume that we may need um, using um, our protocols for vaccination. And we would have estimated that just a little over 4,000 doses would have have been needed and we've gotten the support as it relates to um the PAHO providing same through the revolving fund. Uh, just by way of update in September, we signed the purchase order to acquire the vaccinations in country um, that would be used according to the protocols that we would have developed and agreed upon. Uh, this again is just to put into context that the situation in Jamaica bearing our resource capacity evol evolved very, very rapidly. So by the time um, we would have decided what we needed to do, it was afterwards that the situation was declared uh, a public health emergency of international concern. And of course, this also triggered more attention in country in terms of our multi-sector and multi-government response for containment of the situation in country. On August 5th, we had our scenario changed in country. It didn't take very long. By the time we reported on our third case, we now classified having done the assessment and evaluation that this case was now a locally transmitted case. It therefore means that our transmission scenario had changed very, very rapidly and it didn't take very long. So as is, um, has been identified in other territories, uh, it is quite likely that this is a situation as, that we are, we are not really seeing the true picture in country just yet based on how rapidly this has evolved in country. Uh, we would have 
um, with the guidance that had come out from the WHO PAHO in terms of um, what countries such as us who fall in uh, group two to do. Uh, again, we looked at what we need to do in terms of coordinating the response and engage all the, the, the key persons with regular meetings in terms of those stakeholder consultations and ensuring that we define uh, the particular communities that are at risk and tailor our response messages and interventions uh, to reflect what we are finding as the situation involving in country. Um, the team having been under a lot of pressure we would have been dealing with, again, it wasn't just COVID-19, we're also dealing with the issue of the fact that we were in uh, a dengue season as well, and now we're coming on to the influenza season, so we also have to be doing uh, multiple measures. The same team that is managing um, the, the, the monkeypox outbreaks as dealing with all the others. So clearly we would have had to do a lot more in terms of intensifying our surveillance capacity and what needed to be done to ensure our public health measures um, can do what is required um, to minimize um, how extensive the outbreak will be. Uh, we would have ensured, again, that even though we would have decided our procedures and protocols for clinical management were, were drafted and prepared earlier on, that we update accordingly based on what is going on at the time and adapted as is necessary following the guidance that we would be receiving from the WHO. So where are we? So we clearly we have to adapt our situation to our local context. There wasn't that much information, but we had a little bit by the end, um, by the time September came around, where we would have received some 31 notifications for monkeypox from a little over half of the country in very short period of time. And what we ha would have realized, we would have conducted in keeping with, with, our, with our protocol and tested, um, applied our, our, our measures to discard based on clinical grounds, some 13 of them, and we would have tested, um, the, the number of persons would have tested that reflects, based on what we would have discarded, 18 persons, 18 samples, Samples for 18 persons were tested, of which we would have gotten a total of seven confirmed monkeypox cases. And it is important to know that at this time, all were males, all were adult males, and we these were from four of the par uh, parishes or half of the geographic distribution of countries, uh, of parishes within the country. Importantly, again, all the latter cases were all local transmission following investigation. It didn't take very long to realize that um, the situation changed very, very rapidly. So by the time we hit October, uh, the number of all parishes were now providing notifications. We were getting reports from all parishes within the country. We would have gone in excess of, of, of um, the, the 68 cases notification that had been received and done 39 tests. Out of these 39 tests, we would have gotten 14 persons who were positive. And important to note now that um, amongst the persons that for which we got notification, we now include a child, a young child, 10 month old, and also amongst the positive cases, we were now seeing, we had now um, identified a, a, a woman who is now positive for monkeypox. Again, all cases were um, local transmission following investigation. Important to note, Again, in terms of the outcome, uh, it is typical as to what has been presented. Most of our cases are mild cases and are able to be successfully managed without secretly um, to home isolation. Only one of the cases were actually hospitalized and was hospitalized really for other um, con uh, concurrent conditions that affected that individual. Um, by now, we would have had 64 persons who um, we would have had to have quarantined based on our contact tracing methodology and uh, of importance, again, is, is for the most part, the majority were discharged from facility, um, from home quarantine without sequelae. Underscoring the importance of, of what we need to do and, and appreciate is that of all the 86 total contacts that were identified from the few number of cases, uh, the number of chains of transmission are very small. It therefore means that there are several um, points that we need to address and we, we, we have to, a lot more work to do to get the situation in, in control based on the epidemic, um, epidemiological picture that is being presented and shared following our investigation to date. So, since the data was analyzed for this for today's webinar, uh, over the last week, unfortunately, we now have to add two more cases, um, positive cases, uh, to our list, and we are now totaling um, three 
three active cases presently being managed. So we now have a total of 16 cases in country. Uh, three of them are currently active. Um, as it had already been in the public space, I must highlight that the second case that, that, that we would have reporting on eventually had demise in hospital, uh, but our preliminary information to date is, uh, is, is confirming what we would have presented before, uh, that though uh, the individual would have died, um, the, the, the infection with the monkeypox was one of a uh, majority, many other issues that the individual had, and he didn't directly die from um, the infection by monkeypox. So my last slide here is just to highlight um, what I believe I think is critical at this time, and it's the, the lessons. Um, I think the most important point here, they're not necessarily new lessons that we're seeing, but it has underscored something that we would have picked up, generally speaking, in terms of response, um, came out in the COVID-19 response, and we are now affirming it in the monkeypox response. There's very, um, are, we are more effective at our response when we have from a very high level, strategic level, um, involving the affected community in terms of how we implement the, uh, the public health and control measures. Needless to say, what we do is going to be informed by the information and intelligence that we get from our surveillance program. So whilst we are, in fact, managing several issues at the same time, uh, the, it is important to, to acknowledge the coping capacity of the staff, both not just in surveillance, but throughout the system, but more importantly, the importance of prioritization in the context of surveillance to ensure that we can characterize the situation to craft our interventions. Needless to say, the issue of access to testing cannot be um, underscored uh, because of this is what has allowed us to be able to early on recognize what the problem is, scope the problem so we can define the intervention that is necessary. We did recognize that some of the information that we have is, is inadequate, um, largely because of, of, of the incompletion of some of the information being shared for a variety of reasons. But it is important to note that data is critical and we must do what we can to manage our information management system so that we get as detailed information as possible to, to, to directly define the intervention as required. Uh, it, is, it is critical, of course, again, when we do the, the communication to recognize that we must use um, members or our participants from within the affected company, uh, community to facilitate the dissemination of information that we need. I think that is my last slide, and I use this opportunity to thank um, not just Powell, but also our local team here, especially the surveillance unit, for providing the information for this presentation. I hand back over to you now, Omar. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for this incredible presentation, but also for the comprehensive and robust response that Jamaica has uh, uh, had in, in this uh, outbreak and that could also include the, the availability of the access to testing very quickly and also the implementation of the measure and contact tracing and now uh, the access to the vaccine. Uh, I, I want to ask uh, you only one short question about the, how difficult was or how uh, difficult it is to, to work with the affected communities uh, in this specific scenario in, in Jamaica and how you could do it uh, to, to really involve them. Thank you. There you go. Sorry, I had a little traveling on muting. Yes. So um, again, um, what is important is to appreciate that we're more effective when we do what we normally do and we increase our ramp up as is indicated. So um, in terms of our affected community, we would have had a program to target our messaging, our, our intervention, including our messaging and engaging to target the affected community, um, our, our males, our um, MSMs, uh, persons living with HIV, generally speaking, because we do already have a program in place to allow us to reach the, um, that particular community, generally speaking. And so we leverage that, in, that system and that institution to deliver the information. This works very well 
to prevent um, worsening the issue of stigmatization of the situation in country and persons who may be affected. So it's very, very important. We had to use what we exist in that so that we don't draw attention, especially in the Jamaican context where it could um, create a situation for persons who are exposed. So we have to balance um, those two issues of, of, of the publicity of the situation and at the same time managing and ensuring that persons are affected get the services that they need. So we leverage the existing communication mechanism to deliver those mechanisms and those for the most part, generally speaking, are uh, what we would have done in, in terms of our HIV control programs, persons living with HIV, as well as um, targeting communities for uh, our, our, our MSMs in particular um, that would utilize those channels. Thank you, Nicole. This will be very important in uh, in the long term also, because it's probably we will have more months in, in front for this epidemic and the transition also to... And the issue of sustainability. Yeah, yeah. And this is an experience in the in the region with a good coordination also with the national AIDS program has facilitated all this uh, implementation in a more normalized way. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Um, now I have uh, two questions in the chat. One question is for, for laboratory. Um, but I, I want to ask uh, Lionel to open the camera and also to the other panelists. Um, and this is a question from Marta Ruiz. How, how long is the, the maximum time to, conser to conserve the sample uh, of monkey for how, how long it takes? Uh, Lionel? you want to share with it? Yes, um, sorry, I, I, I had wanted to, to just type the, it's sorry, okay. to just type the answer because it's, a, it's relatively easy. Uh, but yeah. um, so the, 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 sam the samples, if you're gonna store them uh, for several weeks, you can use, um, you eat them, sorry. So you can keep them frozen for several weeks and on a regular freezer, minus 20 degrees. But then if you want to do long-term storage uh, over months or years, it's better to consider an um, uh, ultra um, low temperature uh, freezer, so minus 70 or, or below. Um, for diagnostic purposes, you we usually don't need that. So it's more like maybe for research uh, than for further studies. Um, but um, that, those are the recommendations, over. But if the, the sample is not uh, immediately frozen, how long a sample that is taken from can be taken also? Yeah. To yeah. So, yes. So, to have this information. The recommendation, if you're, yes, that, yeah. Uh, so, for uh, diagnostic purposes, if you're going to um, process the sample in a lab in the next, uh, let's say, five to seven days, it's okay to keep at four degrees, uh, just refrigerated. If it's over a week, uh, the recommendation is then to freeze the sample. Thank you. Thank and you hopefully we don't we we don't have at least in the current AP, AP situation we don't get to to that. We should of course aim to have a quick uh, turnaround time. Yeah. Over. Okay. Thank you, Mirta. Here also, Marta is asking about uh, the protection that can be given for the by standard variety of variola vaccines. Bueno, eh, de estudios eh, viejos con las vacunas de primera generación de la viruela se hablaba de una protección del 85%. Y en los ensayos clínicos para la vacuna de MBA, que es la Genius, se está viendo una protección aproximada del 96% para viruela, pero no en el contexto del brote actual. En el contexto del brote actual es lo que está ocurriendo y es lo que tenemos que esperar un poco los resultados de Europa y de Estados Unidos, que empieza, o en Canadá, que empezaron a vacunar antes para ver cuál es la eficacia en la, en la vida real de la vacuna en el contexto del brote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Tracy also uh, asking about uh, if children are a high risk for encephalitis and pneumonia. Uh, so the, the children are actually the less than eight years old, so a priority population because has more in, in the older information from cohort in Nigeria, we have uh, more information about the high risk of these children to uh, 
a bad outcome. Um, so yes, they, but we don't have a specific information in this outbreak. We have only six children in the region, less than five years, I think. Uh, so there is not much information at this moment, but it should be considered uh, a risk population. Uh, same like a HIV patient with less than 164 or pregnant women. Uh, there are any other question that you can have or any other final comment that you want to do, Nicole, before closing the, the webinar? Uh, Nicole? No? Okay. So uh, thank you very much. I will really uh, express my, my my appreciation for uh, to Nicole for being the, in this webinar and to share with us the experience of Jamaica. And we hope to see you again the next week for discuss the outbreak among tattoo uh, in, in, in Spain. And thank you everyone for for being here. Bye. Thank you, Mirta, Lionel, Catherine, Jimena, for, for the organization. I'm sorry for my English. Thank you very much. Have a nice uh, day, further. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.